A Promelian battle cruiser's Lang cycle fusion engines are still intact. Guinan is attracted to bald men, and Jordy and Christie have had enough Coco no nos. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh rule with Sir Rock Lofton. <laughs> hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. I don't know how I got through that one. That one felt like a tongue twister to me. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, I was impressed. Thanks. Today, I don't even know. I'm going to have to <laughs> go back and see if I actually pronounced everything correctly. Uh, today, we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3, Episode 6, Booby Trap, story by Michael I. Wagner and Ron Woman. Uh, sorry, Ron Roman, written by yep. Ron Roman. And Michael Piller and Richard Dennis, directed by Gabrielle Beaumont. This was October 28th, 1989. Where were you? How are you doing today, Sirac? Doing good. 1989. Yeah. Those are good years. You know, I can tell you where I was in 1989. I think that was, what was it, October 28th? That was 11 days after the big Loma Prieta earthquake, I believe, in the Bay Area, the 7.1 in the Bay Area. Um, so we were still kind of reeling from that. Mm. People like were still looking, you know, through the rubble for their Oakleys and windbreakers. And, you know, it was your starter jackets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember specifically that that. That was the one that happened televised, the earthquake that was televised. Yeah, I was actually um, watching at the, at the, the game. Bay, yeah, I was watching yeah. the Bay Bridge series. The Giants were down two games to nothing. Yeah. The first two were yeah. in Oakland. This one was finally going to be in San Francisco. And at 5.05, yes. the announcer's like, yeah. you know, we got the starters. Oh, tell you what, folks, we're having an earthquake. I remember he called everybody folks. It's like, that's weird. I, I remember that, and I remember watching the, uh, the the TV. I was watching it with my dad, actually. That was one of the few memories I have with mm. my dad as a young adult. And we were watching that game when the uh, service, the broadcast was interrupted. And I was thinking to myself, are they going to bring this game back? They're like, yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking the game's going to come back on. But it, it didn't that day. Mm. It was amazing. Yeah. Definitely the, I was growing up in San Jose at the time. It was definitely the biggest earthquake I've been in. That's for sure. It was pretty wild. Like the streets were like waving. It was pretty, pretty nuts. It was yeah, only 15 seconds sure long, felt. but it felt like forever. Anyway, yeah. uh, everybody, what are you doing in March? We have Creation Entertainment's Trek to San Francisco. That's hashtag STSF. March 8th yeah. through 10th. It's going to be amazing. Sirac, are you going to be there? I'm going to be there. <laughs> Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Wouldn't miss it. Well, check this out. Look at how many guests there are going to be there so far. Uh, we got Brent Spiner, Bonnie Gordon, Casey. Look at Sirac Lofton's here. All kinds of people, yeah. everybody, you got to go to this. It's going to be incredible. It's in San Francisco. You no longer have to wait until Vegas in August. You can go in San Francisco, March 8th through 10th. It's going to be a ton of fun. Whoa, that is a gorgeous Whoa. man. Robert Picardo. That looks like Ryan Husk right this there. Man Hold right on here. a second. Who is that? <laughs> right next to him. All oh, right. Yeah. Somebody else is going to be there. Yeah, I'll be co-hosting all weekend. Co-hosting all weekend. So you'll be busy working. It's going to be so much fun. Sirach and I are going to have a seventh rule panel as well. You guys can meet oh, yeah. Sirach Lofton in person. It's going to be amazing. Go to creationentertainment.com. That's creationent.com. And go to uh, the events page and find it. It's in Burlingame, which is just south of San Francisco, right next to the airport. So you can fly in. You can practically just walk to the hotel. Uh, check it out, creationentertainment.com, ENT.com. All right. Let's get into yeah. this episode, Ciroc. This is kind of a <laughs> legendary episode. And I've heard murmurs of people saying, I can't wait until Ciroc meets Leah Brahms. What'd you think of her mm. and the situation? I liked her a lot. Um, I thought, you know, she was really a good 
on screen match for Jordy. Um, it seemed like her understanding of of the tech terminology and delivering those lines was as good as I've seen someone do it because you know I don't understand any of the stuff that she was saying and I'm pretty sure she doesn't either but the way she said it like she did and it was totally believable just like the way um you know LeVar Burton delivers his lines and makes it 100% believable I thought she was a perfect complement to that because it's not easy to bounce off certain way uh dialogue that is not pertaining well the intention of the motivation of the the language is not the same as what the emotion is conveying mm -hmm. so you know a lot of the stuff that they were talking about was really undercurrent of beefing between a, you know a couple and and that kind of stuff so you to have to express it in a way using you know technology and circuitry and all of this stuff is, i thought was exceptionally done you know that's a really good point about her being a good match for him um because of the way that she was able to deliver the lines uh, this is i i completely agree because you know i'm always talking about how i think that lavar burton was the best ever in all of the star trek iterations of saying nonsense lines but making them extremely <laughs> believable as if he knows exactly what he's talking about. And if you don't, that's on you. But he sure does. Jordy knows what yeah. he's saying. Um, this lady did such a good job that the way she delivered those lines made it seem like there was something very clear and obvious. Like, like if she was saying, hey, the tomato plants are dying, so I'm going to add more water to it. And you'd be like, okay, that makes more sense. I get it. Mm -hmm. But the things that she said, she would say it as simply and as clearly as that. And I swear, I realized at one point that I was like, I have no understanding of what happened in the last four minutes. I literally had to go back <laughs> four minutes and replay that entire, I've never had to do that before. That entire four minutes, I mean, it's a couple of times I've like, was thinking of something else and wasn't really paying attention. But this time I was paying attention, realized I didn't know what was happening, but I'm like, but Jordy and Leah know what's going on. So clearly I missed something, went back, rewatched the whole thing. And I still don't know what was, <laughs> they were yeah. talking about. this is the first time I think in Star Trek history that I'm like, I don't really, I, I didn't understand the science, but they delivered it in a way that's just to compliment yeah. them that to them, to the actors they knew what they were talking about they were talking about a couple fight and you know when a couple fight occurs <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is you know it could be about the silliest stupidest thing but it's a couple fight and that's really the that's all i walked away i I'm, i wasn't even following i was like let me not even try to follow the science the routers the system the circuit overheating it's insulated it's not whatever whatever i i, I don't know I'm not going to try to, you know, even get in there. But I know when a couple fights, they can fight over the remote control, over coffee, over your your leg tapping, the toilet seat up. It could be anything. So, and it usually has the same tone as as what we were listening to because yeah, both people think they're right, right? And it usually comes down to two people that think they're right. And so he thinks he's right and she thinks she's right. And it takes some, you know, butting of the heads for it to get to a point where it's like, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about. Okay, you mean that? That's what you're that specific issue. I'll give you that. That one little grain of uh, detail in the argument, I will agree that you're right about that one thing. The other stuff, I know I'm right about, <laughs> but that little grain, that morsel that we can, you know, hook something to. That is the thing I will acquiesce. And that's that was the moment. That's what I saw between them in that moment where it was like the be, the butting of heads back and forth. I, I designed it. Well, I, I operate it. Well, I, I'm the one who made it up. Well, I'm the one who asked to use it. And it was just back and forth until finally it came to like, yeah, but, you know, I'm using it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I've got experience with it. So, you know, you might have done the blueprint. I built the building. So. I'm telling you, this is marble, not whatever it was written in the, you know, in, in the in the blueprint. 
This is this mm-hmm. this is what we substituted. We took the granite and we put marble instead. So I know you think it's supposed to be granite, but no, I built it and we used marble. So I think that's where it comes down to the argument between the two of them. I didn't really try to follow it. I just love the energy because it, it gave me a couple fighting energy. It gave me like two people that are very well versed in a particular subject that are debating a topic energy. And it didn't matter to me what they were saying. It was the the performance was delivered, you know. Do you think that Jordy was taking her expertise for granted a little bit? <laughs> um, no, okay. I don't think so. No, I think that uh, what I really liked, what I loved about this was the fact that he had an infatuation for this. Like there was already a level of expectation before meeting this character, right? Mm. He was like, oh, wow, it looks like you, you, you know, looks like you know everything. He wrote the book on this, you know, when he was doing the research prior to meeting this holographic um, image of this person. He was impressed by that person's knowledge and wisdom prior, without a face, without a, you know, recognition of who or what he was talking about. So it could have been an alien of any any sort. It could have been any kind of person that he has been dealing with, that he could be dealing with. Not necessarily an attractive person that was also smart in the exact subject matter that he likes. But so uh, the first thing he was attracted to was the brain of this person. So that is where I thought the basis of this entire, you know, thing was going. I love the way it was written because it did start off with him trying to find this kind of chemistry and love. And so it was kind of the episode is really a, almost a love story, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a Jordy love, a Jordy trying to find love story. And I thought that's what, that was the part of the episode that resonated with me that I liked because one, it gives us insight into one of the main characters that we don't get that much backstory on. Right. Uh, you know, I want to see more about Jordy. I want to see what he thinks, what his dreams are, what he, you know, his aspirations. And in this case, you know, finding somebody to a companion to love and talk to and have fun with. And I thought the moral of the story about being natural and being yourself and letting that being the guideline to finding whatever it is that's going to be suitable for you in life. I thought that is an important message as well, because the more you try hard or, or out of character to you know trying to attract something the less you're going to attract it because you're out of your own comfort zone of being yourself so i thought that in itself is a general good idea you know that's a really good point about getting to know jordy better uh as you were saying that i realized that you know one of the great ways to understand a character you know for the writers and for the viewers and for the actor portraying it is to reveal their weaknesses, right? We knew Picard's weakness from day one. He's not good with kids. He's brash. Mm-hmm. He's abrupt. There's a lot of things, right? Uh, we know R- Riker kind of has a weakness, and it's anything with a pulse, kind of. And you know, <laughs> Wesley's got a weakness. It's his. It's his youth. You know, his uh, his naivete, right? Worf's weakness, his, you know, in sports, we say your strength is your weakness a lot of times, right? So Worf's strength is his weakness, that he's just this strong, brash, you know, hit him up. So that's, that's kind of what he focuses on. But we never got to know Jordy as well, because we never got to find out what his weakness is. I mean, he's got a physical weakness, right? His, his visor, his blindness, but that, that's not a personality trait. That's something that he overcomes. It tells us a little bit. But what really tells us about some something about someone is, you know, traumatic events in their childhood or insecurities or, you know, addictions or, you know, anything like that. That's what really gives you more for the character. And now we know mm-hmm. what what this character's weakness is. And that's why a lot of times if you mention to a Star Trek fan, if you say something like, you know, what about Jordy and his love life, for example? Most people will react one of two ways. They'll either laugh or they'll go, <laughs> aw, or a combination of, you know, a lot of people just be like, aw, because it's just like this poor guy, you know, he just he just wants to be loved. You know, he, he keeps, 
he, he's also kind of, you know, and I, you know, I'd love to talk about this more in depth in the, in the second segment, but it's also, there's some things to be said for, is it appropriate? Is he appropriate? Is he inappropriate? Is he, but he's constantly swinging and missing, it seems. Um, but anyway, that was a really good point. Went off on a tangent there. So, yeah, no, I, I like that tangent. Um, and I do want to explore it a little bit more because, uh, I didn't think it was inappropriate, actually. I thought, you know, first of all, it looked like a hologram. Both of those were hologram programs or simulations, right? They were in. I think, no, I think the first one was not a hologram. It was in a holographic simulation, but that was a real one. Because remember, Wesley was like, oh, no, Jordy's back from his date with. Oh, I think it was a real person. It had to be because if he, he can't go on a date with a hologram and strike out <laughs> and he's programming, he's programming the hologram. It's like if he's playing chess against himself and loses, like, what are you doing wrong, man? One side well, has to win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're writing a really bad program. You know, go see Quark. Uncle Quark will, ha you know, help you out. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. So, okay. So that was a real date. Um, we could talk a little bit about that date. Christy was her name. Yeah, you know what uh, that what that date had that jumped out for me was, and, and I don't know, maybe this is way out of left field, but when that violinist started playing, I was like, "Dude, what? Yeah, get me him too. out of here!" First me of all, too. he's too loud. I, I was just like, "You're sitting there on the beach, yeah, enjoy yeah. the relaxing waves, the breeze, the seagulls going by. It's a very relaxing thing." You don't want someone playing the steel drum yeah. or the violin or the trumpet next to you. Get out of here. What are you thinking? Hey, and, the, and the guy literally walked up to her, like in her face was like doing one of these. <laughs> and it's like, I was like, dude, bro, seriously, like <laughs> you're doing, you're doing like a face, a face off with her. Like, uh, if you want violin music, you can just obviously have a, you know, music playing in some ambient, you know, you know anonymous source we don't know where yeah. the source of the music is just in the background like the elevator music it could be there playing but an actual guy walking up kicking up sand on her while he's digging in her face <laughs> like i was like <laughs> like okay, bro get out of get out of our face you just don't want a third person there no period not at but, all you know it would have been extra funny unless it's a bartender or uh bringing drinks like can i bring you a drink what would you like you know, it you know been that kind of a sense. super funny though check this out what if you know, Jordy's just kind of like, oh, you know, oh, man, I brought this guy. And then she's like, can we get the vi And then she stops and goes, is that Brahms? And he goes, yeah. And she goes, wow, you're really good at Brahms. And she starts hitting it off with the violinist. <laughs> Jordy was just sitting here twiddling his thumbs like, are you freaking serious? He's hitting it off with the violinist. Yeah. And she'd be like, computer and violin. And she'd be like, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Hang on, hang on. What's your name? Oh, I'll, I'll wait for you here. You go ahead, Jordy. I'll wait for you back here. Yeah, what's this, we'll pro be fine. What's this program name? I want to use it again later. This guy's great. Can you grab us a drink when you get back from the bathroom? <laughs> yeah. And then show yourself out. Thanks. Uh, yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah, that was, that was a bad deal. Um, I knew it was, it was not a good deal from the beginning. Obviously the body, there was a body language issue, the way she was kind of not looking at him and it was, he wasn't reading any of that. And it's like, bro, you got the infrared eye vision, you know, <laughs> you should be picking up on the uh, body language here. It's not working for you. That's um, point. that was funny too. So, but yeah, um, costume wise, I wanted to say the sweater, she had like this pink knitted like sweater that was really beautiful. I thought, um, it fit her extremely well. It was accentuating her curvature. Yeah. And, and I thought, whoa, this is legit, uh, costuming right here. Also good to see Jordy in non Starfleet stuff. He was wearing casual vacation like cruise, like if you're on a cruise ship, that would, that would be breakers and wear. stuff for 1989. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he looked like he was just ready for relaxation. So uh, I kind of like that opening scene. I, I laughed a little bit with the girl because I was like, boy, strike out, strike out. I enjoyed seeing Wesley and and Data talking about it too. Like, hey, you know, it's just those are those nice slice of life moments on the ship, right? Totally. And then Guinan. 
fitting right. where she belongs, right? They found a good place in the story for her where it's a very good fit. Uh, you know, Wesley talking to Data, you know, they're playing chess at Tenford. Good fit, good fit character-wise, location-wise, what they're doing. Great to have Guyne in there. I thought that whole thing was was good. That's why, like the third season, you could tell that they kind of understand characters better and they're really mm -hmm. trying to explore them better. But yeah, we got to see Guinan finally. It's been a while. And that, and to add to the Guinan thing, um, one extra element that I'm noticing with Guinan is they're using her specifically um, more so in relationship exactly. moments. So they're like, okay, so she could be the relationship advice kind of counselor uh, because, you know, uh, Troy is is being used for more on duty type of counseling, right? Like this, I sense this alien is this or that. Uh, more for the purpose of the mission of the ship. Um, sometimes she'll get into, you know, how are you feeling with Wesley or somewhere someone else? But for the most part, the relationship guru counselor on the ship is is Guinan. Now we can see that she's done taking that that spot on the mantle right which is a perfect fit for her and that doesn't mean that she need her character needs to be relegated to only that because remember she's also non-human she's an elorian so that gives her a little bit more you know and, and you'll see in in further seasons that she's not just the 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 bartender she's not just the relationship guru She's a different alien that lives a really long time, as we've seen in Picard. We saw young Guinan in Picard in the 21st century. So we know that she's got a lot of stories to tell. Um, we know that she can pop up in different eras, you know, hundreds of years ago or hundreds of years in the future. We know that her she has the memories, you know, from her race of other things. Remember how she knew the Borg? You know, she she kind of there there. So there's a lot more to explore there. But on the day to day, it's great that she and Troy now have their own lanes to kind of stay in as far as you know the stories are concerned. Yeah, and, and the way they counsel is different. I want to just add to that too because I noticed right. where Guinan says something like, uh, "She makes you understand how you're how you are or what's going on." by you revealing it she'll make you say it right uh 100 you know you know for example in the measure of a man episode with the scene with picard where she says yeah you know you know people owning people or something to that effect uh invoking slavery you know she she just put it out there and it made picard think oh yeah wait a second hold on you know i i see what you're saying and in this moment, it was like, yeah, you know, you didn't have any pressure. You were natural, Jordy, like you're talking to me now. That's that's attractive, you know, somebody who's going to sell. And so she makes you come to the realization of something. Whereas I think Troy more explains what it is. You like to do this and you are like a this. And yes. because of that, you make this kind of decision and more like um <clears throat> instructional let's say yep. in that kind of clinical way you know what mm -hmm. i mean i completely agree i think that's perfect she's much more informative she's much more you know about giving you information and explaining things to you and and problem solving in that way and guinan is more of guiding you to come up with the conclusions yourself she has the wisdom of centuries behind her. She's your friend. She's not your counselor. She's a buddy that says, I don't know, what do you think? Or, well, I don't know, how would you feel if someone did this or that? Whereas Troy's like, I sense you're angry. That's probably because, you know, it's just a totally different way of doing things. Um, let's hit our break super quick, everybody. And uh, we're going to get back into this. This one's fun. A lot of good stuff to talk about. We'll be right back yeah. on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Frickin' Lofton. Hey, hello, hello. Here are the trivioids of the week. 
Jordy and Christy have had enough Coco No-Nos. I guess I should have looked up what those were if they're a thing. I feel like they got to be a thing. Neither side expected Aurelius IX to be the decisive conflict. A Promelian Promelian battle cruiser's Lang cycle fusion engines are still intact. No idea what that means. The Menthars yeah. and Promelians fought to their mutual extinction. Guinan is attracted to bald men. Gaelic SARS crew behaved courageously. Dr. Leah Brahms attended Chaya Seven Caucuses. Caucuses. Um, there are a lot of tongue twisters in there. <laughs> oh, look, Coco. Uh, what is Coco No No a real yeah. thing? It's got to be, right? Uh, I know Yoko Ono oh is a real thing. <laughs> so I don't know if that's anything like that. Coco No No. Um, okay, let's see. What's a Coco No No? Um, a cocktail. <laughs> you know okay. what? It's I real. think. It, I think it was just invented by Star Trek because everything just references okay. Star Trek. A Coco No-No okay. was a coconut beverage served in halved coconut shell while on a date with Christy Henshaw. Okay. Oh, okay. She got a last I name. I didn't even hear that line. She, she said, got a last name too. Jordy handed her like the coconuts and he's like, yeah. would you like some more Coco No-Nos? And she's like, I think I've had enough. And he's like, me too, or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't even catch that Coco No No. Yeah, there's got to be more to that. We're going to, that's a drink we need to invent straight up, you know, some pina colada or something. I completely agree. Yeah. That would be, that would yeah, be we, really cool. We could take the Coco No No to the next level. Um, I feel like there's a song smoke. in there too. Like, yeah. you get the Coco No No. And you're done, done. I don't know. I feel like there's like some kind of Caribbean tune for that one. I don't know. See, I was thinking the Beach Boys, you know, that's where you oh, want to no. go. Down in Coco, you know no, it. no. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, that works better. Uh, but yeah, no, um, <clears throat> yeah, back to um, Jordy and this um, this computer. First of all, this Leah Brahms, I, I, I like the character. You know, this is Michael Pillar to me because he does like this, this, there's kinds of writing that make you feel really comfortable. There's a comfort level to Michael Pillar style where it's it feels rooted in real real experiences that we all can relate to. You know, the trying to find somebody, the awkward moments, um, and this one was this Doctor Leah Brahms character that. I thought Brett brought out a lot of good stuff in Jordy, but one of the funniest things I thought was when he basically, when, when Leah says, I am the computer or, or you know, I am this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am this, um, the engine, you know? So every time you look at the engine, you look at me and I could just see him like kidding. And I'm like, yo, this is basically going to have sex with the engine. Right <laughs> this is, <laughs> That's exactly what I thought, which was, uh, <laughs> this is the line that I put in there when she goes, I, I, I want to talk about this too, because I was like, am I looking too deep into yeah. this or were they really kind of hammering that point home? She says, every time you're looking at this engine, you're looking at me. Every time you yeah. touch it, it's me. And I said, ew. I, and I just imagined Captain Picard like, walking into like the engine room in the middle of the night and going, Jordy, what the hell are you doing to the warp manifold? <laughs> Jordy's like, what? Not everybody was asleep. <laughs> That's what I, I was thinking the same thing as I was watching this. I was like, so they just made him like have a love interest. That's basically the ship's engine. He's in love with the engine. I mean, so, it would have been subtle if she says, so every time you're looking at the, I don't know, how do you say it in a more subtle way? I don't know, but saying every time you're touching the engine, you're touching yeah. me. You know, every time you're yeah. working on the engine, you're working on me. Or, I, I don't know, like. Yeah, uh, it, and I, I thought the same thing. I thought this is, is this weird? This is, what what kind of uh, category of, uh, fetish is this 
when you are attracted to a machine, you know, it's funny because you always hear like a joke about uh, there's a, there's a joke that says if you could have any car that you've ever wanted or any dream, any girl that you've ever wanted, what kind of car would you get? And it's, it's it's like this man joke that, you know, a guy will always pick his dream car in a situation like that if given the option. Right. Oh, um, interesting. It's just, some, yeah, it's some kind of, some joke that I've heard repeated. Cars are pretty times. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you could have any, you know, if you could, if you could have any car that you ever wanted or the, or you know, the girl of your dreams. Woman. I got you. Okay. Now I get yeah, it. Yeah. Or the girl of your dreams, you know, what kind of car would you get? And that's, that was the joke. Mm-hmm. And, oh, what kind of so, car would you get? Okay. I get it. <laughs> if you could get any car you wanted or any woman yeah. you wanted. What kind of car would you get? <laughs> yes, that's funny. exactly. That's the joke. And so to me, that's applied to, in this situation to Jordy. It's like, if you can have any engine you wanted or any woman you wanted, what kind of engine would you want? Like, I want the Enterprise. Uh, yeah. yeah. Warp. Uh, Warp core. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and the other thing that I thought was a little peculiar is when he said... Can you extrapolate a, a personality of what she was like? And the computer said, within, you know, with a 9% basis of yeah. error or something. And this the whole time I kept thinking, what if that 9% is the 9% that's attracted to him? So, like if he met the real person and he thinks she's gonna hit it off, that nine nine percent of a personality is pretty significant. Yeah. She might like, he might try the joke that worked on Holodeck, Leah. And she won't laugh. Yeah. Or he might be like, ah, my <laughs> my shoulder's feeling a little sore. And she'd be like, rub it yourself, dick. I barely know you. <laughs> what are you talking? This is inappropriate behavior. I'm not going to rub your shoulders. He'll be like, no, but you're really yeah. good at, right? That spot that's, boy, that you really. So that 9% could be. Yeah, it could be really a major deal. Uh, but I did, I did feel that kind of. But there was certain contrast to the sh- to that that I did like, and so in one sense, um, the contrast thematically that uh, Pillar, uh, Ron Roman, and and um, Richard Dennis came up with um, is between the designer and the engineer, uh, be- in the characters between Jordy and this Leah. Brahms character. So you have the parallel there between the designer of the engine and the engineer of the engine. The other parallel was the force versus counterforce of this booby trap, right? It was like the more they tried here, the the more energy they put into it, the more that energy was used against them in this uh counterbalance. And so uh, thematically I thought that was another good tie-in to have these um, polar polarization and counterbalances as main, the main theme that ran throughout this episode. Yeah. The other uh, the other balance there was um, the reality of seeing the ship in the bottle and the dream of putting it in that bottle the childhood kind of, you know, adventurous spirit inside of Picard to do this model building with these ships versus the actual thing in front of him. So there was there was this polarity that that was constantly running throughout this episode. Yeah, that was really funny though when uh Picard says uh it's like playing with ships in a bottle. And he's like, come on, haven't you ever played with ships and bottles and warp goes i do not play with toys and data goes yes i was never a boy very pinocchio like and then chief o'brien saving the day isn't it amazing that we have these recurring characters like chief o'brien and gynan that really fill out the crew you know i really look forward to those the most but he comes and goes oh i did sir and then and then picard says you know thank you mr o'brien and he leaves, and then Riker kind of looks at the chief like you little kiss ass. He's like, I yeah. really did. <laughs> he, goes, yes. he goes, I yes. really did. Ships and bottles, great fun. I'm like, yeah, you stand by that, chief. Yes, yes, and 
I really loved Riker at that moment. So when Riker heard Warp and, da- and Data both reply, you know, that they don't know anything about ships and bottles. Um, Riker took a lot of pleasure in that. And he, you can see him like happy that the captain kind of got is out there on his own on an island. So he took a little bit of pre- uh, pleasure in that, you know, nobody can relate to captain. You know, he knew what he's talking about, but he, he kind of liked that nobody else was kind of co-signing. So when the co-sign came from O'Brien, that's when he looks at him like, hey, man, you know, the captain was hanging, you know, he was doing a good job by himself. And you bailed him out with this little kiss ass move. And he, he completely plays that in the facial expressions of both the pleasure of listening to Warp and, and Data give their response and also the displeasure of O'Brien kind of siding with the captain and, and co-signing in that moment. So just great facial expressions, great camaraderie between the group of them. I love that, that kind of stuff. That's true. There was a lot more personality in this episode, mm-hmm. right? You've got Riker smiling about that. You had Riker and Troy smiling that Picard was so giddy, if you remember that, on the bridge. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yes, I do. Uh, and, and that's what I like. I like and, and he did kind of reveal uh, there was a side of Picard that was revealed in this episode, a side of him that uh, was a drawback to his childhood and the playfulness and adventurous spirit of his childhood. You know, he was living something that he had dreamt up. That's mm-hmm. what I kind of uh, got from this. This is. Picard is living the dreams that he had as a child when he was putting model ship together of ships from a thousand years ago. And now he's the captain living the dream on the ship and also reminiscing about that, those sparks of ideas that got him to this point, which mm-hmm. which was the actual, you know, Promelian seeing it in, in, in the flesh. So I thought those were really good storylines that were made this episode work for me. Yeah, and that's why, you know, an episode like this where, let's be honest, not a lot happens. You know, I mean, obviously, everybody can die at any moment. Mm -hmm. They could die, but really not a lot is happening. But you get to know the characters much more in an episode like this, right? We got to know Whoopi's uh, character, uh, Guinan, a bit more. Data and Wes, you know, playing uh, 3D chess. We got got to know Jordy a lot more, even Picard a little bit more, and Riker and and O'Brien. So it, it's a it's a character episode, and that's you know people get most involved with characters, you know fans you know, care about the characters, and so episodes like this is what people look back on when they're thinking about their favorite characters. But let me just ask you about this relationship with Jordy and Leah Brahms because I'm not sure how I feel about it. First of all, I can't imagine. I mean, they did a great job of, you know, when they, I remember this was the Leah Brahms episode. And in the first 20 minutes, they hadn't introduced her yet. And I was like, how is he going to go through this whole arc with her? If she's only introduced halfway through, how are we going to believe that they fall in love and they like all this stuff? But what they did was he had a personality, they cut away. And then they come back and they're already fighting. So it's like, oh, cool. What they did was they said that arc happened when you guys weren't watching. And that's a much better mm-hmm. way of doing it because then we already know that they're already fighting. They've been in the trenches together for hours together. You know, that's a really smart way of doing it. So mm-hmm. we get it. But I've never, I, I can't imagine that that's a normal thing where, you know, two coworkers or what scientists trying to figure something out and one of them just starts like rubbing their bed. Like I've never seen like a librarian being like, Oh, this Dewey Decimal System, where does this book go? You know, he's sitting there trying to figure out what, and then somebody comes up behind him and just starts rubbing his shoulders. It's okay. You'll find it. It's 376 point. Here you go. Let me like, does that does that happen? Do do cooks do that at Chili's? Where the guy's like, you know, <laughs> he said medium well, but I can't really tell. It looks medium. They're like, it's okay. Shh, 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 shh. And they just I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a little bit of a fantasy. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the writers throw in a little 
something what they would like to happen as opposed to what would necessarily right. happen. Or maybe that's the 9%. <laughs> that's the 9%. That's the extrapolated uh, part. Oh, oh, it, yeah. It's also the computer realizing that uh, he's in stress and he's he needs something to de-stress. Good point. So, um, but I did like the, the dialogue there when Jordy says, don't do that. I don't want to feel that good right now, you know? Um, but, and then didn't know, they the, kiss at the end there? <laughs> yeah, I was they like, did kiss what the end. Yeah. is going on here? So, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. it appropriate, though, for him? I mean, it's that whole holodeck thing. They're creating a character. And, I mean, obviously, it didn't go too far. But, you know, that character did rub his shoulders. He did kiss this made-up <laughs> character. So I'm like, is that so bad? I guess that's harmless if it's a made up character. But if that character is based off of a real person that doesn't know <laughs> that her person is being used for all the right reasons at first, but then I, but then it kind of goes into a more personal way. Then if she saw that, she might be like, um, I'm not... I'm not sure this is why I signed up to make engines. <laughs> I'm not sure this is where I'm going with this. No, I, I, I'm visualizing a, a different ending to that episode. Now that you're talking, it's it's funny. I'm thinking of Picard walking into that engine, to that holodeck or whatever, and seeing Jordy kind of in the corner, um, you know, from what he can see, kind of on in the middle of some action. And he's like, what are you doing, Jordy? He's like, I'm fixing the ship's computer. <laughs> She's like, is this is this why you took till the very last second to yes. give me an answer? You were busy talking yeah. and yeah, figuring it I'm, out. I'm getting us out of this, Captain. <laughs> like, no, you're not. <laughs> there was okay. There was more to that. Actually, I kept thinking like somebody else needs to be watching this episode other than me because I'm, I I felt like I was reading too much into some of these things. Like when she kept saying like. I wish you knew me inside and out or something like, like yeah. he kept saying, they kept talking about like her inside and out. She's like, Oh, that's what it was. She's like, then you must know me inside and out. And I'm like, I, are we I, still talking about the computer? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, is everybody else uh, watching this and thinking that this is totally fine? And I'm just got like some horrible mind where I'm like taking it to a different place. But she goes, that's what she says. He says, I know my ship inside out. She goes, then you must know me inside and out. I'm like, whoa, yeah. this isn't even in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, normally I listen for the music and I think the music really does accompany the, the, you know, the soundtrack of Star Trek when you listen to it. But in this particular moment, the cheesy kind of love music that they played when Jordy was left alone with her, I thought made it too obvious that they're trying to push a little romantic moment. Yeah. Instead of making it a little bit more subtle, it was like, you know, that it's like, here comes the violin guy again. And I'm like, what the hell is this violin guy? He's working overtime this episode. Um, so the the cheesy kind of, music that that is supposed to clue the audience that oh this is the moment where the two are you know getting in together or feeling romantically involved with each other i thought was overdone in this in this episode so i know normally we're complimenting the music as something that really corresponds well in my opinion it was a little dated the whole this is the relationship music time and we're going to play it now to cue that music it was over the top for me and, and a little bit too pronounced. It should have been dialed back down lower in the in the volume wise and not as um, overt as it was to me in the episode. Yeah, uh, the director was Gabrielle Beaumont. I don't remember that name. Do you? I feel like that may have been the first time she directed this. I, and I wonder if maybe the producers thought that a lady might be a better director for something like this. Um, I'm not sure because in the writer's room, if it's all dude bros and they're like, yeah. And then she says inside and out and there's all the time. maybe they're like <laughs> maybe they're trying to counterbalance that by having like 
a lady's touching yeah. there being like, we're going to go ahead and cut this one line. And it, like, maybe this is the tame version of the script. I right. don't know. Well, Jason will tell us uh, when oh, yeah. the time comes, if he has, if there's some more information. But uh, to credit Gabrielle Beaumont on something that I did like, um, there was a moment there when Picard is steering the ship manually. And he's just using, uh, you know, kind of the thrusters, almost like a joystick type action. Yeah. Uh, there was a close up on him, and I liked that close up. I liked the lighting. Um, it was a, it was a nice, just the way his face was lit had a little bit of tones of red in it, and it was a little bit darker. But both him and Wesley got that close up, and I really liked the Picard one. It showed me a, a level of intensity in his face it showed me a level of seriousness and the um how the calculations had to be done just precise for for him to steer out of that uh asteroid field and i also like the line that was used at the end there where picard was referring to now the machines are flying us and that was when geordi is talking about hey we have to let the computer take control of the ship and let it do this thing and and eventually, the opposite of that was true, which is not to let the computer take control of the ship, but to use manual, you know, the manual setting, which Picard did. And mm -hmm. another kind of throwback juxtaposition between the technology of the ship and this more archaic way of steering and flying the ship, you know, using just the, ba the bare minimum, right? flying at 200 feet per second or meters per second as opposed to, you know, warp three. So um, I, I like that as a concept as well. It reminded me a little bit of the concept of uh, the Explorers when we built the solar sail ship to Bajor. It That's kind the of best episode. Manually steering, steering, steering the ship. So I, there was a little of that in that moment. But I really liked that that um theme in this episode as well the whole piloting the ship out of that asteroid field yeah um one final thing on that uh before we go to our uh free for all when they said now the ship is piloting us it reminded me of how i felt when i went from driving a stick shift to an automatic i don't know why but you know like when i had the stick shift you feel like you're driving the car when you switch to an automatic, suddenly it felt like the car was driving me. And I'm like, this is weird. The car's making mm -hmm. all the decisions for me, you know, just kind of a strange thing. And now we're going to be doing that even more with self-driving cars. But yeah, who gets the home run of the episode? Who's today's big home run hitter? I'm going to give the home run to LeVar Burton. Uh, Jordy st stood out to me in this episode. This felt like a LaForge episode, and I thought he did a great job of, uh, you know, being in his wheelhouse and delivering both the awkwardness so that he feels and uh, his kind of weakness and vulnerability that we talked about with, you know, his uh, situation with companionship, and also his expertise and level of intelligence as far as knowing that ship inside and out. Because he was able to essentially argue with the designer of the ship and and one up that designer because he had such a good feel for what he does and what you know, what he knows. So I thought that he stood up in this episode and really carried it. I agree. Easy, easy call, uh, Lavar Burton, um, because it it's not easy to deliver some of this stuff. The, some of this, not just the lines and the words but the emotion behind this one particularly there's a fine line to to walk and i'm not 100 percent sure if they walked it perfectly um as an episode but it's it's kind of a delicate thing and how do you convince people that you're falling in love with a program in 15 seconds basically and all of it's kind of weird but he does it in a very natural way i think he just reads the script and says okay it can be a weird episode but it's a Geordie episode, so I'm going to knock it out of the park. And I think he did. Secondarily, Susan Gibney, who played Leah Brahms, Brahms, she was great. Also, you know, a lot of hard lines to pronounce, to say, to deliver. 
Um, but she did it as well as the emotion Susan behind Ghibli? it. Susan Gibney? Gibney, I believe. Okay. Susan Gibney. Let me check. Um, yeah, she was awesome in this episode. I, I thought her performance was great. And like I said, it's not easy to hold your own against a guy like uh, Lavar, who's just mastered the techno babble, but she was just, she was keeping up with him. And hmm. I thought she did a great job. Yeah, it was Susan Gibney. And she was also, by the way, back in Lower Deck Season 3, Episode 3, I believe it was, Mining the Mines Mines, if you remember that funny uh, titled episode. She was back for a little bit. Also, very quickly, we want to give a very special shout out and thank you to Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, aka Grandpa One, and of course, Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We got the free for all coming up right now. We will be right back on the seventh rule. Please make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening in, give us a five star rating, leave us a nice review. We really appreciate it. Also, find the seventh rule two wherever podcasts are found. Be right back. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. Let your free for all flag fly. That was tough to say. Uh, Melissa Longo is here. Hi. Mr. Jason Oaken has his cool booby trap poster behind him. Eve England is out in Wales. No snow. Carrie Schwentz got some ships in a bottle. Uh, Greg Kenzo is here, everybody, wearing his Neelix and Chill shirt. Allison Leach Hyde, cool burgundy, looks like a uh, Abyssinian kiosk. Very nice. The Dark Lord Chris McGee has arrived. We've got Tierney C. Diekman en route. The Matt Bordenman wearing his Rito's shirt. And Faith Howell doing her best Jordy LaForge impression, arriving just under the gun. <laughs> <laughs> all right there were thousands of people that voted on what they thought on a scale of one to ten this episode should be on imdb and at this point jake cisco guesses what that imdb rating is uh hmm. seven 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 yeah does anybody else I'll have any, seven, seven. Ooh, any guesses that doesn't already know? Seven, Six. nine? Eight. Four. four. No, 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 seven, seven, five. Four. seven five. So Eight, four. two. I just wanted to give something. Eight, two. That's Eve, did you really say six? Mm-hmm. Seven, six? seven six or six point oh? Just six point oh, yeah. She's like, <laughs> oh. Wow. Making way. She's got fire in her <laughs> belly. All right. The correct answer is Mark Eaton, 7.4. 7.4. I seven point four. Seven point four. Very good, Tierney. Seven four. Oh. You get the Ciroc Lofton Award of the day and also the Tierney Award because you've nailed it a few times. You just guess lower than what you think it should be. Journey <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> with the triple D, man. And considerably lower than what we think it should be. Uh, Eve does not subscribe to that theory. <laughs> because she gave it a six. <laughs> it's so hard. Uh, did we have any uh, non-appearance mentions today? I did not catch any. All right. Well, Melissa P. Longo, can you please get us started off on the right track? Holy shoulder pads, Batman. I mean, <laughs> Jordy LaForge. <laughs> Just 
the shoulder, <laughs> shoulder pad action in this episode was off the chain. <laughs> um, overall, I like this episode. Um, I like that we're seeing more and more, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, of the day-to-day life. And, and that leads to character building, um, particularly the scene where um, Worf says, I do not play with toys. <laughs> <laughs> and Dana says, I was never a child. <laughs> mm-hmm. And O'Brien chiming in. But I also like that <laughs> it's interesting how much of a gossipy goose <laughs> Wesley is. <laughs> He knows everything about everyone that's going on on the ship. And um, him playing chess with Data, that was fun, too. Um, The stakes were high in this episode, for the most part. And and I liked Picard's awe and wonder when he entered the alien ship. It it felt like true exploration to me and um, what Star Trek is you know, boldly going where they're supposed to be go- boldly going. Um, yeah, overall, I like the episode. The middle part got a little bit slow for me. Um, and there were some moments where I was like, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> you'll have to find <laughs> out, um, become a patron and and find out what those moments were in Things Left Unsaid. Whoa, what a pro. Uh, everybody in the comments below, tell us who you think is the most gossipy goose on the TNG crew. Let us know who you think. <laughs> Melissa says probably Wesley. Jason M. Oaken is here. What's up, Jason? What do you think of this one? Well, uh, I've heard somebody refer to certain episodes of Star Trek as being sort of these uh, meat and potatoes episodes. Not the worst, not the best, but certainly a worthy entry that you enjoy watching. And I think this certainly qualifies. It makes you feel comfortable. It has a lot of things going for it. Uh, it, it at least the way I see it, it, it has a lot of Michael Pillar fingerprints on it. I mean, I know uh, quite a lot of people had sort of their hand in the um, in the story and the script. But I think if Michael Pillar's name is on the script, he must have heavily contributed to it. Uh, to get credit for it. And it, it, it does seem like that. I mean, we get a Geordie story. It's basically a character story. We get a little bit more there. And, and maybe to some degree, it may appeal to a certain part of the Star Trek audience, especially those who feel like outsiders and may not be as comfortable in romantic situations and who think of themselves as, uh, and probably are, uh, quite you know smart and good at what they do. So it does have certain appeal to it. And I think it's shot pretty well by Gabriel Beaumont. I mean, she is you know, the first female director for Star Trek. And, you know, uh, she was the, you know, the only female director for a while. I mean, she came back and did, did one deep space. I, I think Soraki weren't in that one. But uh, she did one and uh, certainly did an admirable job. Again, it's it's almost like a bottle show, if you will. It's, it's certainly quiet. It has a nicely built-in ticking clock which it doesn't seem artificial. So it moves along maybe slowly in the middle, but certainly there's, uh, there's jeopardy there. And, and it, you know, let's the character show. I think the, uh, the actors are doing an admirable job. Uh, it's also to some degree a study in uh, what you can cut from an episode because I think it ran long and they had to chop some things out. So we'll talk about that later, but overall I think it's enjoyable. And you know, Ron Jones is on. I mean, he has sort of electronic music certainly stands out. Definitely. Uh, Deep Space Nine episode was In Purgatory's Shadow, season five, episode 14. Good knowledge there, Jason. Allison Leach Hyde is here. What's up, Allison? What do you think of this one? This is my least favorite Star Trek episode of all time. Uh huh. You're surprised. <laughs> When I was a kid, they played this episode once or twice a day for three years. It was on all the time. So I think I've seen it a lot of times. I also love LeVar Burton. And I could not handle, even as a kid, his storyline in this with Leah Brahms. It was too cringy for me. You know, I'm 10 years old at home going, no, 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 don't do that. So I have a hard time with this episode because of that. Now, the the booby trap and everyone else are great. 
<laughs> that's really entertaining. The music is wonderful. And, but I have a hard time getting over Jordy and the hologram or holographic Leah Brahms. It's always creeped me out my entire existence with Next Gen. So, yeah, it's a little, it gets really, because she is creepy too. And, but the high point, I love Whoopi. And Guinan is wonderful. And I love her line. Um, yes, I can tell you I'm a woman. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> love that. So that's my high point. But, and of course, happy Picard just having the best time being an archaeologist. So I'll, I can talk about more about all my cringe later. But yeah, it is my least favorite episode of all time. <laughs> Wow, we finally know the mystery is solved. Least favorite. Mm. But speaking of happy Picard, Eve England is out in Wales. Eve, how much did you love this episode? So I, was, I completely agree with Alison. Cringe is what I wrote down. It was from that very start, I was thinking, oh no, what is this going to be? And I, I think, and the reason I gave it such a low score was I think I was really annoyed with it because for all the reasons that Alison was, I think that the story overall, everything else about the episode was really cool. I really liked the sort of archaeology story. The music was great. I loved the sort of aesthetics of that ship and the, um, you know, the skeletons there. All of that was really cool. But I just felt that the Geordie romance part of that just took me right out of it. And it was just so distracting. And uh, yeah, creepy, cringy. And I just think it just could have worked without them going so much into that. I think it would have been really good with him talking and using the hologram, but it w it was just too much. And it's interesting because I was thinking about whether it creeped people out as much when they watched it back then. So I think Alison, you've answered that question because I was wondering whether maybe it's just the way, you know, the different lens that you're watching it with now. Because um, I love the hologram. I I was totally getting... Rachel from Blade Runner vibes. I thought they must have uh, copied her whole persona and the way she just looked and the way, the expression in her face at the start. I just thought it was really, really well done. So yeah, for me, um, again, I, I would have liked to have seen more of Picard being in that sort of non-Picard sort of uh, ca character, happiness and excitement. I, I did actually like that. But I just felt that the, yeah, the way that they presented Geordie, I just don't think it was a good look for him. Mm -hmm. Great Blade Runner knowledge, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Carrie Schwent is here. She's got her ships in a bottle. What's up, Carrie? What'd you think of this one? Uh, I, I like it, but I can definitely acknowledge the cringy bits, especially Jordy's date at the beginning. <laughs> I was watching it with Eric, and when he does his reach around move, I, I look over at Eric. I'm like, Jordy, watch where your hand is going. Don't you don't do that. It's just creepy no matter who attempts to try it. But that's just me. The Wes Wesley and Data, the the him saying uh oh and then Data saying uh oh just made just absolutely made absolutely made made me smile. And the computer just creating the hologram of Leah Brahms just all by itself, just based on a offhand comment, that Confused, confused me a little bit, but I went with it. I loved her outfit. I loved her hair. The hair I thought the hair was very cool. I always liked her voice, so I didn't mind. I didn't mind so much. It probably would, he could have got found some sort of middle ground between just the ro her robotic just standing there and going straight to okay, call me Leah. I'm going to call you Jordy. And also, when she when the hologram first pops up, given how robotic she is at first, why would that version of the Leah hologram reach forward and touch Data's or touch Jordy's shoulder? Can always confuse me a little bit, but I loved Bass. But yeah, Picard having his total you know he was fanboying hard over over that ship and gushing over ships and ships and bottles and i think ships and bottles are really kind of fascinating with the kind of patience it takes to put those together i don't have that kind of patience i prefer doing other kinds of crafts but i think they look really neat 
and just w- watching De- De- Deanna's face was kind of, I think, how my face looked, just her ba- her basking in just the waves of, oh, that was so cool being over there. Just being so cool over there. And to f- to f- to finish off my ins- inspiration for the for the limerick was yeah Gaiden Gaiden ta- Gaiden talking to Jordy you know giving him dating advice and I decided to come at it from what if Gaiden's dating advice had come in the form of poetry like in poetry poetry form so this is what I came up with for that the dating scene can sometimes be tricky. Some dates go great and some end too quickly. You don't need any help. You should just be yourself and remember that relaxing is the key. Excellent. When you don't try too hard, it works better. (laughs) When you try too hard, you end up with the picture behind Melissa. (laughs) Yeah, you just got to chill. Greg Kenzo is the most chill guy we know wearing his Neelix and chill shirt. What's up, Greg, out in Hawaii? What's it like? I bet uh, I bet it's not snowing there either. It's about 69, and that's cold for us. But, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's n- nowhere near the rest of the country. I kind of like this episode. There are a few parts. I mean, so I agree with what Melissa said about the slice of life stuff. Like, to me, that's... Michael Pillar, because Pillar was also doing the first season of DS9, and that's where we kind of saw that develop, right? The, uh, oh, Jordy, buddy, I feel for you. Uh, the you're a terrific guy line, uh, it gave me early high school flashback. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> tricky, but I mean, I think every guy has been, <laughs> at one point in their life, been a little awkward. If you, if that's not you, then yeah, um, it's, it's more than the slice of life. Cause we get to go, like Lisa was saying, we get to see Picard, uh, just having fun. Mm. We get great comedy. It's like anti-comedy almost because there's the punchline is the two guys that the captain's with are just like. The, the, the shirt and they're like no i don't yeah anyway that was great that seemed new um the past season seemed like they usually started in a situation or on a mission captain's log here they're they're laid back oh, yeah um and i have to say at least jordy didn't mean to create a hologram of leia roms right like the computer did it Outside of him, he, he gave her a personality, but then I, I mean, I think I'm not trying to defend him because, yeah, it's it's pretty, it could be bad, it could be taken advantage of, you know. Um, but really, it's uh, he created life in an instant, like a new life because it's not exactly um, it's 0.9 percent uh, margin of error. But let's see, almost finished. Is and I think this is the first time a hologram saves the day, which is like um, the inception of the Doctor and Voyager. Because, you know, I mean, you get there, Sirach. See, <laughs> he saves the day. Yeah, philosophy. When you're out of options, sometimes trying less is the option. Keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Thanks, everybody. Great stuff. Thanks very much. For that, Greg Kenzo out in Hawaii. Uh, all right, we've got Faith Howell here. What's up, Faith? What do you think of this one? Okay, so um, I, I'm going to take the other side, Greg, and I am going to defend Jordy. I love this episode. I always have, and I definitely saw it in different eyes. Um, watching yesterday, uh, there is a lot more creep factor than I remember. I also somehow blacked out everything that wasn't Jordy and Leia Brahms. Um, so I don't know what on earth my kid brain was doing, but, um, I definitely have always loved this episode and that was considering all the cool parts got deleted. So anyway, but, um, 
I really, really love uh, Susan Gibney. I mm-hmm. think I fell in love with her as Leia Brahm. So I don't, I, I have to overlook the, the creep factor because she's amazing in this and everything I've ever seen her in. She's been in NCIS. She's been in DS9. Um, and, you know, she's peppered in a lot of other places. So I just really, really enjoy her acting anytime I've seen her. Um, and so, you know, and also I don't think Jordy intended to create a hologram and fall in love with it. I think some of us just anthropomorphize things a little easier than others. And when it looks like a human and talks like a human, you know, maybe don't kiss it, but there it is. I don't know. (laughs) Good advice for any part of life. (laughs) So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this episode and I would watch it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe great point. That's something. Kiss it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe she said maybe. Maybe. Don't kiss. Maybe. So I mean, I but your cat. You that. talk to your cat and tell me you've never kissed your cat. Okay. Oh, I kiss my cat all the time. Are you all kidding right, me? All cats deserve <laughs> kisses. Period. But Sirac, uh Yeah, Susan Gibney, who played Leah Brahms, was in two episodes of Deep Space Nine. I think it was Homefront and Paradise Lost. Right? Is that what? It, yeah. Okay. Um, she was like the lieutenant okay. next to the mm-hmm. admiral. She was great. Um, ben mm-hmm. Teen. Yep. Ben Teen. Right. Very good. Thanks. Yep. Tierney. She was a commander. C- Tierney C. Diekman is here as well. What's up, Tierney? How are you? What do you think of this one? What up? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm so sorry, Allison, that you got this episode. This is your your repeat all the time episode i know we've all had a few of those on the the days of of reruns um yeah now i love this one because it's it's ex- oh my god not because but it is extremely problematic if you look too hard at it so we'll not do that right now um and i i like it for a lot of the little things and definitely uh susan gibney um but just the, those little the little moments that are just so awkward that give you more depth to to Jordy and and Guinan uh in particular it just uh, just starting off the episode I, I wish instead of of Jordy's head in the most horrible version of a mug um I had a coconut for would you like another coco no no could you pick a clunkier name for your dream date programs drink? Um, like it's all so awkward and what someone thinks is the perfect date program. And it, oh, it's so uncomfortable. And then Guinan's, you know, I uh, the first thing I, I notice in a man or however she puts it is his head and his mind. And uh, what a great all around of, you see their their face and the shape of your head and the thing you're going to look at the most, and that's what appeals to you aesthetically. But then, what's in there? Um, and and yes, that that line of uh, being a woman. But uh, they, Susan Gibney in particular, this is what made me the one on a rewatch a long time ago. Really look into her and learn about all that she herself, uh, maybe not contributed but got herself involved with in uh star trek in the next generation era star treks um and um it's seeing uh i i looked up even some articles that they had some interviews they'd done with her and it makes you think a little bit I, i'm not sure um there there's probably been some but uh they uh, they they developed more Granted, she's a hologram in this, but um, another interracial relationship, a woman who is an extremely brilliant scientist and a strong character, um, you know, things that that came from her in this part. And then she felt after being almost slighted in a way from all her auditions, uh, uh, definitely we'll go into that and things left unsaid, that her bit as Captain uh, Benteen in DS9 was like a consolation prize just because she just kept getting almost there and then somebody else just came in and fit a little better. So I like this episode just just because of her. She's just great. Um, but yeah, meat and potatoes, good way to put it, Jason. It's not great. It's not terrible. 
but it's it's important in its way. Um, but yeah, it's a good one for uh, it's, it's a good one. Great Jordy mug, by the way. Anybody just listening in? She's got a Jordy mug and she's sipping mm-hmm. peptide oh. tea out of it with mint frosting. Mint frosting. I can't think of anything. Uh, <laughs> all right. Chris McGee is here. What's up, Chris McGee? What do you think of this one? Well, as Jason said, it's a Jordy centric episode. Thus, I love it. Um, I will say uh, it's it's episodes like this one when a character is saying the word computer often, which caused me to have to change the wake word on my Amazon Echo smart speaker so it wouldn't be triggered every you time I watch episodes off. like this. <laughs> you said the word. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> At least I didn't say the A word there. Um, I, uh, it, I will admit it does have plenty of cringe, as everyone has already mentioned, especially, especially watching it now while I'm older and hopefully a little bit wiser. Um, I've mentioned many times before how much I love Ron Jones music. And of course, the score in this episode is, at least in my mind, practically legendary. Uh, and I've even, even been able to detect... I think maybe certain cues from it in other shows too. I don't know if maybe they were taking a cue from Ron Jones in this or not, but, um, and Jordy's final lines in the episode about technology solving problems and enhancing the quality of our lives. But sometimes you just have to turn it all off. I think that's extremely relevant today with things like doom scrolling cyberbullying and YouTube comments affecting the mental health of so many people. Do yourself a favor, schedule some time every now and then to unplug after the show's over, of course, to unplug and perform some digital detox. And yes, that includes the violins. Um, I did not detect any, some kind of, or some sort of in this episode. So many memorable quotes though. It's hard to pick just one. But I, I managed it, and that is, we're all smiles down here. Uh, I thought there would be some some kind ofs too, because when they ran into the booby trap, but I didn't catch one. Um, and well, also, someone else did. Everybody in the comments below, you heard what Chris McGee said. Only leave nice, sweet, funny, and friendly comments <laughs> to our videos. <laughs> the Dark Lord says it. Uh, the Matt Boardman is here, who has been known to leave some pretty nice comments in his own right. What do you think of this one, Matt? Well, I have to say that this is my favorite Star Trek episode of all time. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 but I do like this one. It's um, it's funny because I, I love doing these free-for-alls because I always learn something new about these episodes. and And it's great to to see other people's insights onto this. And, and there are definitely parts of, of, of Jordy's story that, that are uncomfortable, especially right at the end. Um, uh, that to me, like even watching it this time around, I was like, Ugh, okay, that's a little, that like a, a little ick, but I love all the other stuff. I mean, I, I love, there's some great humor in it. We get some great Guinan moments in it. We get Picard, doing what Picard likes to do, being an archaeologist and 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 actually getting to go off the ship and not having to to sit on the bridge and and uh watch what everybody else is doing. Um and I can't I, I've been kind of in and out with a cat that's needing my attention, but has anybody mentioned Gabrielle Beaumont? Not in the free for all, I don't think. Okay. Gabrielle. So you guys you, I'm sure you and well, Oh Jason did. Jason mentioned it was the first uh, female mm-hmm. to direct yeah. Star Trek. I, I think, you know, so I think that's that's cool. But I and also the another thing that I thought was really cool that I read about was that uh, this the the uniforms that we're seeing are the uniforms that are it's like the final version of this uniform that we're going to see from this point pretty much until the end of the the series. So, but I, you know, I like these slice of life ones. I like that we we're, we're getting to know these characters more, and uh, it reminds me. The last thing, real quick, I wrote 
the, they used to have a pocket books used to have a, a, a contest called strange new worlds. And it's kind of a, I don't know, a trope of, of the next generation that, that Jordy is very awkward when it comes to dating. And in my story, I started it off with an awkward Jordy date that ended early, <laughs> inspired by this episode. <laughs> but uh, overall, yeah, I love it. I think it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and and maybe it's uh, you know for me it's a little easier to ignore the parts that maybe aren't as fun in favor of those that I do enjoy. Great stuff, thanks, Matt. And by the way, awesome background. The uh, set design was so cool there with the ship in the background too. Really cool. Uh, all right, everybody. Jake's final take. Um. Yeah, um, I was thinking that if the entire fate of the ship and the crew is at stake, would you leave it to Jordy by himself in a hollow suite to just get it on with the computer? Or would you have like a team of engineer experts kind of working together to collaborate mental brain power? have like Wesley there, all of the geniuses that you could possibly have in one room so that you could kind of come up with a solution faster. I'm thinking, you know, we're all facing imminent death and, and Jordy's thinking with his, you know, whatever he is. And it's like, bro, let's focus on the mission right now. Cause <laughs> I think that, you know, you and your dating life is not the priority when we're talking about, 26 minutes of radiation you know uh on the horizon so i don't know i'm just thinking it would be a bigger team a co bigger collaborative ep uh, effort not like go lock yourself in the hollow sweep for a second when you're done you can come up with an answer let us know i think it would be a lot more hands-on than that and i'm sure if i was probably the, you know if i was the captain i'd probably want to be there some of that decision making too so i would have liked to see it a little bit of that too um, I do like learning about cultures and, and the older kind of other technologies that were going on. I think that was one of the comments Picard made about how this Promelian battle cruiser was, you know, built a thousand years, you know, before we even had the technology to even get to this kind of level. So I, I like that kind of, uh, when you put a contextualization of development between different civilizations uh, across the spectrum. I, I like that context and reference there. Um, yeah. And, and there was a, a, I mentioned earlier, but I want to say again, I did like a couple of choices that uh, Gabrielle Beaumont made, particularly the close up of Picard on the steering of the ship. I like that moment. It brought, it added to the, gravity of it i did feel like there was some kind of technical prowess that only picard could pull off like you know he, he couldn't let wesley do it he's like I, no let me do this i have the expertise to hit the thrusters when they need to be hit or whatnot and so i felt like it just showed us the value of picard's knowledge and and experience over the years and being useful for these kinds of moments um so i like that also like the backstory on Picard's character with the ships and model building. Um, it just gives us a little bit more of a backstory that shows us something human about him and, and something you can kind of relate to. Like it's a version of him playing with toys and to some degree, like Worf said, I do not play with toys. <laughs> so, but it, it shows Picard playing with toys and makes him more human, makes him more kind mm -hmm. of relatable to me. Um, and so, yeah, th those are the takeaways. Um, and then uh, lastly, I will say, I think that uh, Jordy trying to get it on with the computer at the end was kind of a Coco no-no by itself. That's, that's a Coco no-no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> And we did look up Coco Nono, by the way, everybody. It's not a real thing. It was invented by Star Trek. And Ciroc said, we got to have Coco Nonos one of these days. We got to come up yeah. with a recipe. Ooh. I think Eve's probably I found right a recipe person. online for one. No way. Sorry, uh -oh. Eve. Chris beat you to it. What, what is the recipe? <laughs> 
Uh, one coconut and its juice, about 70 milliliters. Uh, 100 milliliters of spiced rum. Of course, it's rum based. Yeah, of course. Uh, juice of a half an orange, about 80 milliliters. Two dashes of bitters and optionally soda water. Oh, no pineapple? Yeah, no. Apparently not. I put a link in our chat there for it. Mm. Right. So I'm not sure how I feel about that one. I guess we'll have to find out. Well, thank you, um, Melissa, Jason, Allison, Greg, Carrie, Eve, Chris, Matt, Faith, and Tierney. For myself, Sirach Loft, and Melissa Longo, and Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all very much for joining us, everybody. Enjoy your Coco Nonos. Report back and let us know how they are. Are they delicious? We'll see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>